progress. So good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the Lord's word today, should we ask for his guidance so that we may more fully understand that which is before us and that we may be able to properly apply this to the time in which we live? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we see our great need of you. As we open your word today, we ask for your guidance, for your direction, for your angels that may attend us. Show us that that we need to understand today, Father. Be with us, please. Direct us as we open these words. May our minds be ready to receive the examples that you would have us to see. May your will be done. We ask for your blessing. Because at this time, we know that we have sinned. But we also recognize that without you, we will not be able to walk in the paths that we need to follow. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity of joining together. I thank you for each of the brothers and sisters that are here this morning. Be with us now. I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's several things that we were addressing yesterday. But the one thing that, that is really kind of striking to me is kind of a different thought. Now, Theodore, mm-hmm. are we not looking at a song here? Yes. Yeah, it's a song. Now, if we were to look at this as a song, could we not break this up into different stanzas? Well, yes, definitely we could. And um, I don't, it, do we have the paragraph markings in this at all or not? There are no paragraph markings offered in this chapter. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask this just as a just as a point of reference. I know that we've gone quite far into this book, but as we look at this, let's consider the points that, that may be here. The first three verses that are right now on the screen before you. Yeah. Are these not offering praise to God and showing why we should be praising him in all things. Mm -hmm. Now, as we come here into the next couple of verses, could it be said that this these verses describe the scenes that we would that would have been seen, say at Mount Sinai. Yep. Yeah. So it's going to bring us to Mount Sinai. So these first five verses are praising God and showing his leadership in all that's going on at this at this point in, in the children of Israel's history. So could we say this basically as a as a, a second stanza or a, a type of a repeat back against the first three verses? Mm-hmm. I guess you could. Um, but... Hmm. 
So as we continue from here, we come down here to what we're seeing in the next verses of Judges. Yeah, bringing us back to Shamgar and comparing that time. Okay, so if, if we look at these next three verses, from the days of Shamgar and the inhabitants of the of the villages ceased, cease, and they chose new gods, and there was war in the gates. Could we say that this is referencing the apostasy that is continued within Israel? Yeah. Are each of these segments so far laying out different situations that have are, are, are beginning to lay out different situations that have occurred within Israel? They, right. it's you know, the summer. They, yeah, they, okay. they have praised God, but now they're turning their backs on God mm -hmm. in this apostasy. Does this in any manner show us things that have gone on within the movement? Yeah. Then how do we see this? How, if we were placing this to a line, how would we be able to break it down? Um. Well, that, that I think is, is the problem. I don't know um, if this is reviewing. So, okay. Now, when we we'll go back to chapter two. So remember in chapter two, how it begins at 9-11, right? Yeah. Uh, the angel of the Lord that came up from Gilgal to, to Bochum, which is probably to Bethel. And... And we mark that as being 9-11. Now, here there's going to be the song of praise um, at the beginning. Uh, but then it's going to move to Sinai. Now, is Sinai parallel to 9-11 is the question. Can we make the presentation? that Sinai would be 9-11. Yeah, because God comes down on Sinai. Right, and the angel comes down on 9-11. Yeah. So, so can, we, can we take that and place that on the line there? <clears throat> okay. Since this is a discussion, what do the rest of you think? Is this possible? Would you agree with it? Yes, I think so. With, with, with the angel descending, I can see the parallel, definitely. Okay. The smoke and the fire is symbol. What was that the interim? The smoke and the fire Iran put in there. Okay. The, the symbols, their symbols. Because, yes, we would have the smoke and the fire, especially with the, the falling of the Twin Towers. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so that, and then it's going to mention Shamgar next. Right. So that's going to be because um, originally you're going to have, you know, Othniel in, in chapter. Um, chapter one. Yeah. So you're going to have, um, you know, Othniel, then you're going to have, well, in chapter two, you're going to have, let me see, is it chapter three? Yeah. Chapter three, you're going to have Othniel. Ehud and then Shamgar. 
Okay. okay. So in chapter five here, just is just going to mention Shamgar by name. Um, but I think it's sort of typifying that period of time. Well, it's, in, it's also interesting that it mentions here the days of JL. Well, that's just the time they just had. Well, no, here's the reason I'm saying this is interesting. Okay. You've got the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath. Now it says in the days of Jael. It does not say in the days of Heber. It is the days of Jael. So we have gone from a male example to a female example. Okay. So we have gone from one that would exhibit civil authority to one that is representationally that of a church. Okay. Why would these two figures be intermixed in this way? It's also interesting because as we go a little bit later, we're going to see that JL is, is mentioned again. Okay. So <clears throat> just like with a song, you have a like a, a key verse, something that you're going to return to again and again. Mm -hmm. This is not more, this is not like a chorus. Six, seven, six, seven. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think she meant to. Okay. Yeah, she heard. Um, yeah, so, well, yeah, there isn't a refrain here in, in this song. No. Um, which you have in some psalms there there is sort of a uh, a structure that that occurs in hebrew poetry so you got um you know repeating in large you have parallelisms um you have common phrases picking up each of these verses and i, I haven't spent time analyzing the whole structure of it but um probably easily do that okay but well, we have this section verses six seven and eight because this is in in this in this type of a situation we're looking at the apostasy and the punishments that have come upon the israelites Now, when we look a little further, the next section begins to address the fact that when they are obeying God, when they are doing what God has shown them is necessary, that their lives are much easier. And I would ask if that's not, if that's not something that we can see in verses 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And 10. Because verse 8, in saying that they chose new gods and that there was war in the gates, was there a shield, a spear seen among 40,000? If you're choosing new gods, you're not willing to follow God. You're not willing to do what the ruler of the universe would have you do. But yet, when we look at this, my heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord.
So as we look at this at this part of this of of this song, is Deborah not showing the blessings of obedience? <laughs> mm -hmm. So if we come down here, 11, 12, and 13, they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of the villages of Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. If they are rehearsing the righteous acts of the Lord, if they are telling others of God's loving kindness and mercy, are they not lifting their voices in praise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now we're being told here, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinul. Now, you cannot offer praise when you're asleep. You cannot offer praise when you're dead. Mm -hmm. When we are dead in our trespasses, when we are mired in sin, how often is it our choice to praise God? Yeah, well, you need to praise God, you need to be delivered. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles and the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. All of these are words of praise. All of these are examples of what we should be looking at. Now, When we come to this section, starting in verse 14, is she not calling out the different tribes? Mm -hmm. Is she not noting that the tribes are not doing what they should be doing? Yeah, they're not doing um, what they should be doing, even though if there's a few from some tribe, uh, but mostly it's just that they're, not supporting the war. Here's where the 10,000 play in. Because if we have 10,000 that are being called out of just two tribes, we're calling out a very small number, a small remnant. Mm -hmm. And it's that remnant that is doing the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Can the 10,000, in this case, be some type of a representational of the 144,000? Well, they could. I mean, it's a remnant uh, in some sense. So basically, is she saying to the tribes, you have shirked your duty. You have not done that which God would have you to do. Mm -hmm. Is she not in, in a way of speaking, 
rubbing their nose in it to show them that they have been not faithful as they should have been. Yeah, but you know, there's this very, I mean, you're just talking in the general sense, but there is this specific, you know, she names these specific tribes as she goes down this list and right. references to them, right? Ephraim being a root of them against Amalek after the Benjamin among thy people and out of makers. So these are, as you noted before, the, the descendants of Joseph. Ephraim, or not the descendants of Joseph, the descendants of um, Raquel. Raquel, yeah. So, so you got Joseph and Benjamin, right? Right. So um, we have we we now have Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, and then Zebulun. So there's four, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the the question is why is Zebulun mentioned here? Because it's going to be Zebulun and Naphtali that we have the ten thousand, right? But then out of Zebulun, it's it's listing a specific group out of Zebulun, right? Uh, right. These are they that handle the pen of a writer. Um, and even if in just a normal sense of how we would look at that, as it's translated in the King James, um. What does that imply out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of a writer? Is this a representation of a, a scribe, of someone that is to note the history? Okay. Okay, so the pen of a writer, yeah, so this would be a scribe. And um, yeah, so we have a scribe, obviously, but the pen of a writer. But um, now remember, we looked at the word handle, and, and that word has to do uh, to draw, uh, to prolong, to develop, to march, to remove, to delay. To continue to go, extend, forbear, to scatter, to stretch out. And this reminds us of the 2520. Okay. <clears throat> the pen being um, a scepter or a staff or a tribe. And and then the writer having to do with enumeration, to count accounting. So this is almost more like an accountant. Right. Um, than than who's recounting history, you know, recording history. Now, but this would have to deal with the understanding that we have of chronology. Well, could we address these tribes as being either unfaithful or cowardly? Well, these tribes here, um, parts of them actually did join in the battle. That's what I understand. Um, because we have out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. And after the Benjamin among the people and out of Maker came down governors. So you have some some people that are, are assisting them. Um, but you're going to see that the other tribes that are going to be mentioned, like Issachar and Reuben and, um, and Gilead and Dan and Asher, they're not going to be uh, involved in this war. Right. So what else do we see here? So anyway, you have this section that we've been studying for a while, the section dealing with this account of the tribes and their various involvements or non-involvement right. in this um, campaign. Yeah, 
you know, and I'm still working on, on structuring all this, putting it together. So I've been going through the different tribes. I've found more connections with dates. But, but it only has meaning if we can put them together in a structure, right? So some of the, the structures we found, especially like with Issachar, um, dealing with the election and um, and other ones, you know, that are that are connected. Um, can't remember. Yes, yeah, so that was well. Issachar, we connected that to um, to also to Jeff's birthday, and this created a whole structure of things that came from understanding Jeff's birthday and its connection uh, with the election of of Biden. So there's still more to 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 put together. Now, the other question I would have is what do, like we can take these tribes and we can look at their blessings or other aspects of these tribes and we can see how they're connected. Right. It's occur, of course, with uh, the symbol of the donkey. And. But they would represent not just theological ideas or messages. Um, but basically groups within this movement to some degree, or even outside of the movement. Okay. <clears throat> like when it says, out of Ephraim there was a root of them against Amalek. Well, why is Amalek mentioned here? Well, is this recounting this war or some other situation? I would have to think it's recording some other situation. Okay. I would think this is giving a an overview of this with these tribes that once you were willing to follow God, now you're not you you're not giving 100 percent in you're not following him with your whole heart is what i'm trying to say okay so could this be referring to judges chapter 3 verse 27 uh so 5 14 would be referring to and it came to pass when he, he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. So this is going to be under Ehud. Could very well be. Right. So, <clears throat> so it's not specifically referring to this battle, but it's referring to the fact that they were involved in these other battles, but now they're not involved in this one. Okay. So not... I'm going to ask a question, but I have to take care of something as well very quickly. So I'm, I'm going to pose this question for conversation. I've looked this over. <clears throat> of the tribes of the nation of Israel, in this part of the song, where she is going through this with the tribes, Nine tribes are mentioned. Why nine? Why not all of them? And what's special about the three that were not mentioned? Yeah. Okay. Now I'll be back in a, in just a couple of moments. So do you want do you want to take over the, the yeah. share on this? Um. Well, I can just. Um, no, you can leave yours up. Okay. I'll be back in just a moment. We stop if I need to. Okay, so we know the tribes that aren't mentioned are Simeon, uh, Judah, and uh, what was the other one? Was it uh, anybody remember which are the other tribes? Because um, we have Joseph Benjamin. I think it was that God. Yeah, Gad. Gad isn't mentioned. Um, 
though there may be an oblique reference in the sense of talking about uh um where's this here um somewhere there was here a mention on the other side jordan but but there isn't a direct mention i can't remember where this is but yeah so you have simeon uh judah and gads so they're eliminated from this list why why would that be Anybody got ideas? Yeah, and, and and I can just switch to my screen here. If you go to view options, it'll show you. Uh, we can look at these verses. So why would we not have Simeon in this list? Anybody with ideas on that? Now we, who did we come up with that uh, were not mentioned? Well, Simeon, Gad, and Judah. Obviously, Levi isn't mentioned because it's not counted as one of the tribes. Okay, so why Simeon, Gad, and Judah? Okay, so we, we asked the question about Simeon. Nobody answered. <laughs> okay. Um. I mean, Simeon, and I went here to the blessing. So we know that Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, you know, and we know that this is the case of Levi being scattered among the tribes because Levi ends up becoming the priesthood and gets uh, cities in the different locations within the different territories of the different tribes. Um, and Simeon is... Uh, scattered to some degree as well being connected with judah so this would be in the south right doesn't simeon end up being in the south along with judah yes so these would be the then northern tribes but we also have gad unless gad is obliquely mentioned in judges chapter four or chapter five um I was trying to find where that was. Um, um, Genesis 40, sorry, Theodore, Genesis 49, 6. I mean, you could check this uh, to confirm it, but in my Bible, it says, regarding Simeon and Levi, in their self-will, they dig down a wall, which is translated, brought disaster upon themselves. Okay. Their swords are weapons of violence. Yeah. Okay. But as far as not being mentioned here, they wouldn't be the northern tribes. Um, 
but then you're going to have mentioned uh, in Judges chapter 5 in verse um, okay so you know, if this is correct if if we're looking at this Simeon their territory basically would have been surrounded by that of Judah, right? Yeah. yeah. Gad's territory would have been one of the three on the eastern portion of the Jordan. Yeah. Now, they mention Gilead here. Um, I'm trying to, to found it, and then I lost it again. Um, they mention Gilead. Okay, a Gilead abode beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? It could be Gilead is a reference obliquely to Gad. Okay. Because um, that's, that's the territory where they reside. Right? Right. So uh, if that's obliquely, then Gad is mentioned. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The Gad is mentioned, um, just not in a direct way. Okay, so if, if this is the case, then taking this numerically. Yep. The second son and the fourth son of Jacob are not being mentioned. Right, and they're in the south. So they're not Correct. part of tribes so are they then being applied as symbols of the second angel's message and the other angel of revelation 18 to and four you're saying simeon and judah yeah okay explain why you would say that well i'm looking at their birth order okay so just their birth order right. so the reading of the message so the originally the second angel's message be judah no be simeon or yeah simeon pardon me um and then the fourth being judah right okay what's that what 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 i'm trying to do with this and looking at this musically you you have a better understanding of music and music theory than anybody else mm -hmm. but music is also very much based upon time signatures which is numbers yeah so when we're dealing with something musically we should have something that we can interrelate with Kalmoni. okay <clears throat> so whenever I'm seeing two and four together, yeah, I'm asking, is this representationally telling us to pay attention to the second angel's message and the other angel of Revelation 18? Well, it, it that I mean, it could be. Um, hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, that it's definitely they're they're the ones that are left out. But we know the ones then that are mentioned <clears throat> all the northern tribes. So she's not going to address the southern tribes. So the northern tribes are going to represent um, the group that is following Protestant schools of thought. That's the group that's affected by um, this message of, of Parminder. Now, if I look at this in the other way, if, if Gad is not being indirectly referenced, Gad was the seventh son and is the is one from that of one of the handmaids, right? Yeah. 
But if we're looking at 247, if we look at these multiplicatively, we would, would we not come out with 56? And the inverse of 56 would be 65. Yeah. And of course, 65 has importance within the movement. Yeah. I still think Gilead has to be a reference to Gad. I mean, okay. I'm just, I ask the what if. Yeah. And, and to me, that's too complicated of a calculation, but. Okay. Yeah, too many, too many uh, steps. But um, I, I think the main thing is, is separating this north and the south. All right. Um, so the north, you know, when it comes to the understanding of, you know, because when we dealt with uh, um, the prediction regarding uh, the presidents of the United States. So we go back to the Civil War and we know that in the Civil War, we have the North being the Republicans and the South being the Democrats. But it's reversed here if, if we're going to look at the symbol, right, with Israel. Right. So, you know, when you go to Isaiah chapter 7 and you deal with this Civil War, uh, Judah ends up being the South, uh, you know, when it's, it's God's church, it's Adventism. And the northern tribes, they're going to be Protestantism. When we have this invitation that's made uh, prior to the destruction of Samaria, that's going to follow, uh, you know, roughly, well, I guess that invitation roughly 17, 16, 17 years later uh, in Second Chronicles chapter 29, uh, I mean, that invitation is to northern Israel. And so we've always taken that as the message uh, to Protestantism, to the Levites, or, or to the, not Protestantism, but to the Levites that are, that are in uh, Adventism, but are affected by Protestant thought. So, I mean, we have these switching of, of these symbols. I mean, symbols can have more than one meaning. But when you have a north and a south, what is it that you have? I mean, on the simplest level, don't you have a division? Yeah, because that's why I said it, what you have, but I was actually spelling it H A L F. I, I understand. <laughs> Sarcasm is a great language. Yeah. So, so, so you, you, you see the point here. I do. This division that exists within within Israel, within God's people, the sons of Jacob, uh, we have this division that happened in the United States and that still exists, division within Adventism. And so, you know, what's being divided and what symbol represents who will depend on what you're looking at, like which group you're dividing. Sure. And, and you can't just simply say, you know, the north is going to be the bad one and the south the good one because it switches around. Right? right. So um, here in this case, oh. the north. So. OK, so if we um, so if we look at what this application, we've made this application to the movement at the present time. And we know that we have um, this battle being fought, and this battle's being fought in northern Israel. Right. And northern Israel is representing, when we apply it to our movement, it's representing what group? Or is it representing our whole movement? Well, I would have to say that the representation would have to be on those that have rejected in any manner the message of July 18th. Okay. But we're still going to have uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. Right. 
involved in this battle against this this enemy that they had not removed from the land. So these, of course, are northern tribes. Um, Now, and remember, the, the thing is, we had Odilio connect Zebulun to, to July 18th, going from the date of the, camp, the last day of the camp meeting for the organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, so May 23rd. Um, well, I think he, yeah, so he went to May 23rd. We know the vote happened on May 21st. But the last day of the camp meeting is May 23rd, 1863. And he counted uh, 57,400 days, I believe, for the 57,400 of the tribe of Zebulun going to July 18, 2020. But it's going to be out of Zebulun, right, according to this uh, earlier verse. Uh, that they that handle the pen of the writer, the, or these that are, um, uh, counting the tribes. Game. So the counting of the tribe Zebulun becomes important. Now, So the, the problem that I'm having, the, the, the thing that I'm trying to understand, because you asked the question, which tribes aren't there? And it's going to be Judah and Simeon. It's going to be the south. And Judah ne no, normally represents, um, um, you know, God's church. Like if you're going to be looking at Israel and Judah in 1798 and 1844, you're going to have this gathering of the Protestants. They're going to be represented by northern Israel. 1798 at the end of that 2520 and then at the end of the 2520 for judah the seventh adventist church is going to be gathered but here we again have northern israel and this wouldn't be um i mean northern israel is this movement in this illustration and judah is not included All right. So so how do we apply that then? I mean, we, we've made these applications, but what is the consistency? Can northern Israel represent this movement as well? I think it would have to. Yeah. What's the reason we can do that? You mean which of Miller's rules can we apply? Um, yeah, I guess saying that, I mean, it, I mean, symbols have more than one meaning, which isn't um, listed it explicitly as a rule. But is there anything else? Because when we go through these judges, um, right, you know, you, you start here with the just death of Joshua. And we went through this history from 2001 to 2023. And then you're going to go through uh, these different parts of Israel that are going to be under attack, right? So with Othniel, um, who's going to be affected which part of israel can we it's it's going to basically be all of israel so it's going to be 100 percent. well yeah it's just all of israel is is affected so we're going to see different parts of israel are represented at different times so when we looked at Ehud, this is going to be in uh, the east, right? Agreed. And then we have uh, Shamgar that's going to be in the west. 
And then chapter 4, Deborah at Barak, that's going to be in the north. Right, so we can see that different parts of Israel are affected at different times. And, and I'm not sure what that means as a symbol. Um, you know, then later on you're going to have Midian. And this is going to again be more in the west. Um, and then you're going to have... Uh, I'm not sure where this is. This might be, I haven't read this whole section. This might be in the south, I believe. But So anyway, you're going to have different parts of Israel being oppressed at different times, which is one of the reasons why you can't just add up the totals and get the total period of the judges. But um, we have northern Israel. We have this battle. Is it is it because it's it's symbolic of a battle? Um, over an era that is connected with false worship with northern Israel. Parminder's teaching. Good, very well be. Okay. Okay. So, any other thoughts on that? Well, the various symbols. Could they represent different factions that have occurred within the movement? Uh, in this chapter, you mean? In this section of the chapter, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, different people that weren't supportive. Right. And, and weren't supportive in different ways. I, I mean, that's definitely possible. I don't know how you could do this in an objective manner, other than that we have these spans of time and they might connect us in some way. Um, and one of the things, so one of the things we have here that, that you know, I made mention of was uh, the divisions of, of um, Reuben, which it mentions twice. Right. So, so we said that, you know, Reuben had, we had connected Reuben, uh, with uh, the span from uh, November 4th, 1888, which is the last day of the camp meeting or the uh, general conference, the famous one, uh, to Parminder's um, uh, being anointed as an elder. And then we had that... Um, and, and that was whatever it was, 446,500 days. And then we had uh, the 40, 465 days from the rebellion on August 29th, 2019 uh, to um, December uh, 6, 2020. So that uh, declaration. So we have these two rebellions that are connected. Um, and, but yet we have these divisions of Rubens, and I was looking at this as dealing with some kind of mathematical idea, which, which I think is the case. And one of the things we looked at, and you sort of caught on to it when you were looking at the difference on my chart there, uh, where we would have, uh, uh, Judah and Issachar, and you looked at the number difference, which was 20,000. 200, right? So you're understanding what we were, were doing there, correct, Dwight? Right. So somehow these differences, either of the tribes themselves, so the difference from numbers 1 and 2 to numbers 26, or also just differences between between two tribes, the, the difference between the number of those tribes. Now, I created a chart where I 
So I haven't finished it yet, and I don't know why. Because I only compare the differences of the tribes in numbers 1 and 2 with each other, and then numbers 26 with each other. But I never compare number 26 with the different tribes in numbers chapter 1 and 2, which I need to do. So I have them separate, but not the two together, which... Does that make sense? So I need to uh, remedy that. I think it's got a logical point. Yeah. So, so what we would then look at, I mean, and because we're dealing with some things here that are subjective and some things that aren't subjective, right? There's, we have some things that are objective. Numbers are objective. Now, there might be a subjective element in, um, you know, how we interpret the connection between these spans of time. But a span of time is, is at least objective in and of itself. I mean, when you're going to count from the camp meeting in 1888, and you're going to count uh, to um, Parminder's ordination, as an elder, um, you know, a person could take, well, that's that's actually showing that, you know, he was correctly an elder, right? Right. The problem with that is that Parminder has rejected this entire methodology altogether. So if you're arguing that this methodology proves that Parminder is a correct elder, well, that wouldn't make any sense because he doesn't accept this. He's actually opposed everything that we're doing with with these numbers, right? So, so we'd have to point it as a negative aspect. So, so I still think we have to we have to work this out. Um, I'm going to try to get some time to do it before uh, Sunday morning to kind of put these all on a line, these spans of time, so that, you know, we can sort of look at it. It can make sense looking at it because looking at them in a chart with just a bunch of numbers, it doesn't really tell you much. Even if I give you the dates, it's when you see them visually. Um, so... I don't know. I don't, I just, that's, that's where I keep coming back to of what we have to accomplish, but we should look at the rest of this chapter from your notes. Okay. Well, your notes are still there. So as we, it, they're both shared. So all a person has to do if they want to look at your notes is go to view options in zoom and you can choose between Dwight or me. I mean, I could have just stopped mine, but we might want to go back to that. Um, okay. So, we, as you on. said, my notes are still up. Yep. So if you just go to view options, anybody goes to view options, they'll see your notes. Okay. So that's when you go to... Uh, um, right at the where that so you got the green and then they got the black there stripe right because mine mine is saying i'm still screen sharing so yeah yours is a screen sharing so am i right? okay but I'm I, don't, I don't see yours you'd have to go to view options to see mine that's what i'm saying yeah i'd have to stop the share oh you would yep because you're sharing okay right. anyway, i'll stop my share We'll just do that. Now yours is still sharing. Right. Okay. Okay. So as, as we continue to look at this, of course she goes through, and now we've identified that there are 10 tribes mentioned, two tribes that are not. And so this goes right back to the division that later occurred within Israel. Yeah, because it doesn't exist yet. Right. Right. Okay, now, 
the next section, the next segment that we deal with is we have a record of the defeat of the Confederated Kings of Canaan. So starting in verse 19, the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh at the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Why is this important? Why are they noting that the stars in their courses fought against Sisera? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. So, I mean, you might say that... Um, that there's a chronological aspect um, at play here. Okay. We're not dealing with astrology. We're not saying, you know, the stars weren't in their favor. In, in the, yeah, in the, the Bible, also, sorry, the Bible also speaks of priests having courses of service. Yeah, I don't know if that's, that's, I'm going to have to look that up, but I don't think. So am I. <laughs> no. I don't think that would be related, but I'm, you know, I'm not a hundred percent certain. Well, so what is the word for stars there? I mean, I don't think it's talking about actual stars, although it might be, but I think it could be a, like a potentate, somebody really important or well, an angel. Those that are really important, like high angels. No, I would I would deal more that this has to do with chronology because the, okay. the stars, you know the sky is a timepiece. Um but you know it's figurative language language, so we wouldn't take it um you know literally. Yeah, so this course is um or paths, as um, the translators give it. This would be more like a highway or a path or a road, which is not related to the courses of the priest. Just happens to be a, a word in English that uh, has two different meanings. Okay. So as we deal with this, with these kings of Canaan, mm -hmm. we're also seeing that the river of Kishon swept, swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon, O oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Yeah, so you have the heavens and you have the river. Right. right. So these are two contrasting ideas. Now, how do we understand rivers symbolically in prophecy? That uh, sort of gave away the answer. Well, aren't aren't waters people? Yeah, but when you deal with something like, let's say, uh, the Euphrates or the Hittical, Aren't we dealing with prophecies? Don't they symbolize prophecies? Rivers? That's an interesting way of putting it, yeah. Why would Kishon then represent a prophecy? I mean, I understand the Euphrates. I understand the Hittichel. But this would be the prophecy of November 9th. Okay. Or, or something like that, something connected. So Parminder makes this prediction, right, regarding November 9th. But it's it's going to sweep him away. Right. right. That is, the prophecy doesn't come to pass. So it's not, it's not a prophecy from God. It's a prophecy from the Omega. Uh, 
that's I mean it's a guess, you know. Sure. But to me, it would make sense. Okay. There were, there were the horses broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. In both of these verses, they are repeating a phrase. Is this not a doubling? Well, definitely it's, it's a doubling. So the prediction of Kishon, the prediction of November 9th, then when we're looking at this with the horse hooves, as we've said before, horses can also be representative of Islam. Yeah. So these horse hooves are going to be broken by means of the prancings. Now, now prancings itself is just a word that means to gallop, right? So, but they're using it here in this way, and it, um, but it, here it means to move irregularly, to curvet or move irregularly, and. But the other translation is also the tramplings. What else is there that is trampled down? Well, the truth. Right. But in this situation, there were the horses broken by the means of the trampling, the trampling of their mighty ones. Mm -hmm. And that's and mighty ones, of course, it uh, says here, mighty ones from the Hebrew 46, referring to mighty or valiant of men, angels, animals, or enemies, metaphorically, princes, sacrificial objects, and obstinate figuratively. Okay. But often it's ref, can refer to God, too. The H forty six one. So this section, we see this next verse. Kershi Maraz said the angel of the Lord, Kershi bitterly the inhabitants thereof. Because they came not to the help of the Lord, the help of the Lord against the mighty. So, curse ye, curse ye bitterly. So, we have a phrase, we have another adjective that is applied with that phrase. Because they came not to the help of the Lord the help of the Lord against the mighty. Yeah. Now, what you don't see here in, in um, the King James. Okay. Um, so when it's cursed bitterly, that's just the same word twice. Okay. So what's so big about Moraz? I don't know anything about Moraz. <laughs> well, it's a place in Palestine, I can see. It means refuge, a refuge, like like a refuge, some place where you hide. But it's only used in in the Bible once, in the King James, uh, Judges five twenty three. So, wasn't the tent of Jael a type of refuge for Sisera? And doesn't Isaiah 28 talk about a refuge of lies? There's at Isaiah 8. I get those two chapters mixed up. Yeah, but they're, they're not, um, you know, just, yeah, I mean, we couldn't say we have the English word and we can make cross references. 
but I, I think there is, um, you know, we we need to figure out more about what this mirage is as a symbol, the the actual place. So. Well, since this is the only verse that this appears in, it makes it difficult for us to be able to compare it. Yeah. Yes. But the main thing is they're not going to come to the help of the right. of, to help the Lord against the mighty. So that's going to be up to JL. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this here, that this is being applied more about the kings of Canaan before we go into this with JL. Well, okay, Miraz is a town. And since it's not going to come to the help of the Lord, it must be a Jewish town, an Israeli town, right? Well, how, how would you define that? I mean, it's yes, it's a place in Palestine, but how would we know this as being Jewish? Why couldn't this not be Canaanite? Because they don't come to the help of the Lord, which they should. I mean, you wouldn't say that of a Canaanite town. But weren't there times where um, pagan powers were used as a, a way of chastisement on the children of Israel? Don't we see that with Babylon? Don't we see that with the rod of my anger from Assyria? Well, but these people aren't fighting against Israel. They're just not helping them. Okay. Right, that's... So that you know, it's an assumption, but it would be a sound assumption. I'm just trying to examine all of the possibilities. All of this is for conversation. Well, I think by not helping them, by not helping them, they are by default fighting against them. Okay. Yeah, because Miraz, you know, because Sisera's army is going to pass by there, but Miraz isn't going to do anything. But they should have, what I gather from this verse. But it, instead, it's going to be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. And so the contrast would have to be here between God's people and, and a group of people that's more loosely associated with them. Okay, now. This next section, starting in verse 24, this is an extraordinary praise that's being placed upon JL. Blessed above women shall JL, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. Now, <clears throat> I think we are all familiar with the story of Mary, Jesus' mother. Because doesn't the angel say to her, blessed art thou among women? Mm -hmm. So here is J.L. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. So, blessed doubling. Again, twice this is occurring. He asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. But this is not recorded in the prior chapter. Why would in the song, 
Why would this be referenced that she brought forth butter in a lordly dish? Why is that important? Well, you're saying that they didn't bring, but they don't mention them in her bringing butter. No. Yeah, but they're using this as a um, just as a parallel. So this would just refer to the the milk. Okay. Now in the chat it says that there's plenty of references to Miraz by Ellen White. Given the hour of our study right now, I think we'll have to look at Miraz again on Sunday. Yeah, so she talks about this. So that would fit in with what I was saying. Um, okay. Well, when we when we reassemble on Sunday morning, what we'll do is we'll go over the passages that Mrs. White has. We'll go through them chronologically and see what we're able to determine about Miraz and how we can apply that within this section. Okay. So what you're saying is that the mention here of butter in a lordly dish is just to expand upon the idea that she gave him milk? Yeah, look, I'm saying that the the parallel between milk and butter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're that just means curdled milk, right? So it's not like she brought butter as per se. Well, so so she's going to give him milk, and it's probably just that that's what she had. Okay, but you know, it says that she gave him a bottle of milk, right? Well, yes, but again, you're dealing with Hebrew being translated into English. Right. <laughs> um, so exactly what that is, um, it's hard to say. Um, I was just trying to compare the bottle with the lordly dish. Yeah, because it can be a bag, a leather bag or a skin. Like a boda. Right. So... He, no da in in judges 419 and and then you're dealing with the poetic language here um in judges chapter five um so it's just going to use because here it says a bowl but um so i think in a lordly dish which would be an excellent dish so so I think there's a reason why it expands upon this in this parallel is that the way that I take it, there's different ways that parallelisms occur, but one way that they can occur is they can first refer to that which is literal and then uh, add details in something that's more spiritual or symbolic. Okay. But so it says she asked the water, he asked the water and she gave him milk, which is what happened. But now she's going to say she brought, it's going to say she brought forth butter in a lordly dish. And, and so if we're going to look at this as a, a, a repeat and enlarge, it's now going to apply some other imagery that uh, would help us understand what this message is, what it's symbolizing. Okay. So could we say, you know, somebody asked for water, but this message, um, you, you're going to give milk, right? So people want to have milk. But also, this message is is something that's more than milk. You know, butter in a lordly dish it's 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 an expansion of of the truths that have been given to us in the past okay so it's it's not quite water it's not quite meat it is yet the milk of his word 
but it's an expansion so that we need to understand that it is more than what was originally sought. Yeah, it's been aged or it's been modified in some way um, that we can more easily digest it. I don't know. Uh, you know, all I'm saying is that you have this have this imagery and it's expanded upon. Okay. And and what we are trying to do with this movement, what we're trying to do in understanding this message, is to present a message that is is developed. Right? We're trying to develop a message. I mean it, it's it's a difficult thing to do unless God is leading you. You definitely can't do it. But we've been in this movement for a long time, and and this movement has progressed. But there are different ways in which it's progressed. We've had some who have gone off the path, so they think they're being progressive. But what we have tried to do in our studies is continue to go back to the fact and see that it's established correctly. Now, I'm not sure what it means, you know, he asked water and why she gave him milk, what that would symbolize, other than um, milk is going to be more nourishing than water. Or the milk of the word versus water or something? <laughs> yeah. Well, but he asked of water, why she give him milk? I mean, I still don't know specifically what that would mean in the context of this movement. Maybe the person doesn't realize, you know, they want water, they want to have the Holy Spirit, right? But they need to have milk first. Possibly, yeah. I don't know. But again, there are some things here that are subjective. I mean, we could explain them different ways. And that's why I think we need the objectivity of these numbers. All these things together. Okay. And then, you know, later we're going to have the mother of Sisera and stuff. And, you know, and the question is why? I mean, who does that represent? Well, we will, what we'll be doing, given how late the hour is now, yeah. we're going to return to this section. We're going to start with Miraz. We'll go back through this regarding the praise that is being given to JL. And then we will look at this with the mother of Sisera. Okay. So that's now, where we that's what we will do when we begin on Sunday. Yeah, and I'll still keep trying to go through and illust you can get all these lines drawn out so that we can put them together, but I'm not guaranteeing that I'm going to get it done by Sunday, so. Okay. Okay. Um, so any other comments or questions at this point? Okay, shall we pray? Yep. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this discussion today. We thank you for these verses that are presented and for the ability that we have to consider that which you have had written for our admonition. Be with us today in our efforts, direct us, so that we may walk in the paths that you would have us to walk. May we more truly represent you and your character to all of those with whom we come in contact. Be with us now, guide us, we ask. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.